Big stuff coming this Tuesday. Obviously, there's a whole lot to talk about, especially the leaks. I'm going to try to avoid talking too much about the leaks, although there's a couple of things I do want to talk about. But mostly I want to talk about the developer blog that was released yesterday that had a lot of really, really interesting tidbits, a lot of stuff that I like, a lot of stuff that I didn't like. Um, but more than anything else, a lot of stuff that I think we have to wait and see on before we make any judgment. I want to give you guys some questions that you're going to have to ask yourself the day of the release and maybe even the weeks after the release to ask if this was a successful patch, if this was a successful bunch of changes or not. Um, there's really too many things to track here at once. I don't think anybody has really any accurate predictions just yet. But as always, I'm going to ask questions that need to be answered the day of the patch. So let's actually go to the developer blog here really fast here. I'm going to give you guys the TLDR and mostly highlight things that I think are deserve highlighting, um, competitive play updates, seeing how and why your rank changes. And let's actually talk about this. This is really, really, really crazy. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we can surmise that was basically hidden um, behind the matchmaker. Um, basically, what this means is that when you are on a win streak, you get to see this at the end of the match. Hey, you got a buff because you won multiple times in a row. Oh, your SR goes up. Oh, you lost multiple times in a row. Okay, so now your SR is going back disproportionately more than it did before. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that was already in the game going back even to Overwatch 1 and was even in the game in Overwatch 2, but it was just kind of kept behind the, uh, under the, uh, what's the what's the term for it? Kept under the uh, the hood, right, for lack of a better term. That stuff that you didn't really see, didn't really know what was going on behind the scenes, and so it could lead to a lot of frustration because you didn't really know what was going on. Like, uh, for example, this one, for example, you weren't favored, but you won. Why did I gain? So I had a 5-4 card. Why did I go up an entire rank? Well, because you probably had a couple of games that weren't perfectly even uh, and you were favored to lose, but you somehow won a couple of those games. And so even though you only had a 5-4 and four card, you went up a whole rank or maybe a rank and a half. Uh, we've also had the times where the opposite is true, where we've gone like on a 5-2 or 5-3 uh, and you those two or three losses or even just that one loss that you had. Uh, were really, really easy games that you should have won and somehow you managed to throw away. And so the game goes, that's that's actually pretty bad, mate. You shouldn't have done that. We're going to punish you for that harsher than we actually would for. Uh, and the other ones are like the calibration. So your rank is uncertain either because you haven't played it a while or maybe your MMR is fresh. So volatile, you lost calibration matches after ranking up. In other words, after ranking up, those calibration matches where it's trying to find out if you're actually at the rank that you belong, you lost those. Um, and I think that's obviously something to kind of keep in mind as well. Uh, same kind of things there. You weren't favored and you lost, so it doesn't really hurt you that much. Um, and anyway, long story short, you could read through all these yourself and do some thinking, um, but it's pretty self-explanatory. But this is, again, nothing new, so, but the visual of it is new. And I think this takes a lot of the guesswork and a lot of the frustration. You see, there's nothing really worse with not knowing what I needed to do. Why am I going five and two and, and, and losing SR? Like, why am I going five and four? Like, where in the rank do I go or how much further? And this fixes all that. Now, this is also probably the most important thing here is this. This is SR, guys. This is SR coming back. This is the equivalent of like, let's say that you're silver five and you're 70% of the way through. Let's say this is actually, yeah, it's about 75%, 70%, okay? This means that if you're silver five, this is the equivalent of Overwatch one, uh, what, 1,570 SR? The percentile is leading from zero to 100. And so if you got this all the way to 100, you would be 1,600 SR on the dot, silver four. And then if you got your silver four meter to around 25% or 30%, let's say, then you'd be 1625 or 1630. And this is essentially the SR system come back in a cleaner module, for lack of a better term, uh, that it's a little bit easier to understand, a little bit easier to see percentage wise. So even though it'll still be silver four, silver three, platinum two, GM one, and so on, um, it's going to be SR basically all over again, but also with a new rank at the top. And let's bring this to our next point. Bring a fresh start with placement matches and rank resets. Now, I know everybody's excited about this. I'm going to rain in your parade just a little bit. I don't like this idea from a competitive integrity standpoint. A lot of people were like, well, people in Overwatch 2 have been boosted and they're not going down. Overall, the Overwatch 2 MMR system is fairly responsive. They're very, very aggressive with their uncertainty with your MMR calibration, all these sort of things, much more so than Overwatch 1. The only exception to that rule is if you were to play like one or two games per season, even if you were bad, you could technically kind of hold the same rank. But the vast majority of people aren't doing that. And if you're only playing one or two games per rank, you're not really ruining that many games because you don't belong. It's just only a couple of games. Whereas this has the potential to ruin a lot of games by resetting everybody to about a middle rank. It's not going to reset everyone to a low rank. It's going to pull them down a little bit. Um, I've heard a lot of terms that being thrown around that it's maybe like a soft reset. Uh, regardless, though, I think that this is something that's going to definitely disrupt a lot of things and potentially boost people because this is the crucial thing. 10 placement matches, pick your best heroes and say hard because these games count for a lot. And that is not necessarily a good uh, competitive integrity statement. 
It means that those games are going to matter a lot more than any of the hundreds of games that you've played prior to that or maybe the games that you've played after that. That's maybe a, a bit of an exaggeration, but you can kind of see my point here. If you get lucky, um, you pick the right map for your characters, uh, maybe you have a good teammates, just those five or seven or eight out of those games, um, you're going to boost yourself here. And I think this is the key thing here, that this is more of a PR move than anything else. It's not a bad thing. It's going to get people to log into the game. That's great if you love Overwatch. However, competitive integrity-wise, it's definitely it's definitely a bad thing. Um, uh, it's going to make people log in. It's going to make people want to gamble. Maybe I could do better. Maybe I can do better, higher, better. Uh, and then ultimately, it might not place them in exactly the right rank, depending on how well they played for those 10 games. You might actually be dropped. You might have a couple of bad games or get unlucky uh, and be placed lower than you really should be. Now, that does that mean that you can't get back to where you were before? Of course not. You'll get back right to where you were, especially with all these new changes coming up with Overwatch 2. Um, but... Uh, it's still, it's not the brace. And the worst part about this is that's the thing there, the new changes to Overwatch 2. If you're going to incorporate a rank reset to kick the people that don't belong at the rank out, that's understandable, if not exactly perfectly logical. However, it's not something that you want to be doing at the same time as significant balance changes, because there's going to be some outliers here. Uh, let me give you guys an analogy. What if they did a rank reset at the same time of Malga's release? A lot of people would have abused Malga that weren't even that good, would have found a way to abuse Malga, shooting tank, and boosted them up significantly during those 10 rank up matches. They would have skipped a lot of steps here. Uh, and I think that what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot of people that first couple of days before everyone gets sorted out, before there's a hot fix, uh, before there's an actual balance patch to, to patch maybe the broken characters or the goofy things. And some people are going to boost themselves um, because they figure some little weird trick or niche or not even a purpose, right? Maybe you're just playing your characters and, whoa, this is crazy. This is really strong, you know, I, and you're going to boost yourself. And I, I think that that's kind of, Again, not a great time to have a rank reset. So I'm not criticizing the idea of the rank reset. The idea of the rank reset from a strictly like a, a publicity standpoint, marketing standpoint is great. It's going to get a lot of people to log in, which is awesome, but it is an objectively bad decision for competitive integrity. Is it going to be a bad enough decision to make, make it a bad decision overall? I don't really think so. I think it's probably fine. It's going to definitely be a mess. Let's put it that way. A lot of people are going to get boosted. There's going to be a lot of whining about the same people that wanted the rank reset in the first place. <coughs> Bronze players calling ELO out. <coughs> Pro players saying people don't belong here. It's, it's both ends of the spectrum. Um, but, I mean, it's going to get people to log in. So if you don't mind if you don't mind that like me, I don't really care, then it's a good thing for PR. Um, and I guess this talks about the champion role. Uh, this was called, I believe, Ultimate initially uh, at the Blizzard, uh, BlizzCon. Uh, and I, I hated <laughs> the name Ultimate. We already have the word ultimate in the game, uh, but they moved it on to champion, and I think that makes a lot more sense. Pretty cool icon. Uh, it looks a lot like the top 500 icon, but with more of a purple, pinkish, iridescent game. Um, and yeah, it's it's cool. It's cool. There's nothing really else to say here. So yeah, it's fine. Uh, new competitive rewards and jade weapons. There's a lot here detail-wise. I'll let you guys read on this. It's basically just they're going to be having some legacy points where your points transfer over, um, and there's going to be some different types of competitive points. Um, my hot take here is that I think these are, it's fine. It's free content. Why, why would we complain? Um, but I'm very surprised that they went with green out of numerous of other colors that would fit a lot better. Um, I think like an electric blue, uh, a, a red, um, you would have silver, uh, black, like an ebony, an ivory, a white, um, a translucent, like a diamond color. There's so many other colors that I would choose uh, before I would go green. Uh, and so I think these weapons are going to be really, really ugly on the vast majority of heroes. Um, but it's going to be really cool for some heroes. So it's just, it's a strange choice to have the second choice of color after gold to be green. Odd. Um, so Someone in Blizzard must be a big green fan because it's, it's it's a choice to say the least. Uh, but that being said, there's no real complaint here. It's more of just a criticism of, I think there could have been a better color chosen. Um, but, you know, again, free content, so can't really complain. All right, we'll keep going here. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, end of season bonuses, introducing changes to core gameplay. Now, this one is really, really important and probably the most important thing we're going to be talking about today besides the SR change. Um, developing a more consistent field of firing and landing your shots in your opponents. This is a very silly statement, frankly. Um, more consistent field of firing and landing shots in your opponents is basically a non-issue. Overwatch is notoriously a difficult mechanical game. That's also what brings people to, you know, that's what makes people enjoy the game is the challenge of the mechanics, the verticality. Obviously, it is a little bit more mechanically difficult than a lot of the other first-person shooters out there, um, but there are ways to outplay that by game sense, cooldown, positioning, and so on. And when you do hit those shots, it feels really, really good. It's the lack of uh, movement, uh, the, the ability to freeze your movement. That's so, so important. Um, so this one is a weird statement to me, but the next two are really, really, really important, I think, and, and good statements to say. The lessen the impact of burst damage for allowing for greater counterplay. So the looking to deal with burst damage and specifically some form of one shots, most form of one shots. Um, adjust where in-game healing and damage are effective to reduce stagnant team fights. In other words, um, 
basically how effective is this healing and damage in a stagnant team fight. All right, we'll get to that in a second. Um, all right, so making your shots feel good at it. One of our main goals for these adjustments is to make firing your weapon abilities feel more consistent without impacting the time to eliminate a target and without removing the overall feel of gameplay we all know and love. When knowing, examining, excuse me, how burst damage values have changed over time, we found that in most cases, if they've gone down in raw value, that it may not necessarily be, become weaker relative to the other changes. So burst damage overall has gone down, but it still can feel very potent in Overwatch too, with the too much healing and, and the removal of one tank and so on. The 5v5 environment new here is certainly factoring that perspective, but it's often overlooked that the player's skill level, game knowledge, pace, the gameplay, and so on. And this is it, guys. Projectile size changes. 0 0.05 meters for hit scan projectiles with a high rate of fire or spread, Tracer's pulse pistols, Reaper's Hellfire shotguns, 0 0.08 meters for hit scan projectiles are more precise. And you can read all this, but basically the TLDR is that every single projectile in the game, almost without exception, a few exceptions, but almost without exception, I believe Honest Sleep Dart is also excluded from this, um, has been increased. Now, before you guys lose your heads, um, I do think this is prob. I mean, it has to be easily the most risky change that they have made uh, in Overwatch 2, maybe ever. Um, and I think it's important to, let's, let's get a, some perspective here. Um, uh, let's get you guys, this is an interesting little website that you guys can actually check out. Um, here, let me show you guys what this is. Let me pull up a little image here. I'll actually have this uh, Reddit post linked in the comments. Um, Somebody remind me if I don't. So you can check this out real quick here. And this basically gives you perspective here. So you can look at all the different projectiles changes here and compare them to this is plus 0 0.5 meters. So that would add 50% size to Hanzo. Um, but wait, no, it's not Hanzo because Hanzo is a travel time projectile. So that's going to be 0.0. It's actually going to double Hanzo's arrow size. Um, and then, you know, for Tracer's pulse pistols, you know, what's Tracer, you know, and so on. And so basically this is a huge, huge change that's going to make shots a lot easier to hit. Now, before you guys lose your head, is this going to make the game easier? Potentially. Is this going to break the game in some way? Probably in some way, shape, or form. However, this is going to be married to one other thing which you really have to say at the same time, which is health pool increases. And so this is not necessarily going to increase the time to kill. What this is going, or decrease the time to kill, what this is going to do is it's going to reduce the, uh, the potential for one shots. Um, Instead, instead of having one character like a Hanzo hitting a 250 HP target in the head, and that's pretty much it, um, you will not be able to one-shot 250 HP characters because all the 200 HP characters are going to have 50 extra HP. Now, that means as a Cassidy, you're going to have to two-tap somebody in the head to get a kill. Whereas with old Cassidy, you had to one-tap somebody in the head and then body shot. Now you have to two-tap to get somebody by 200 HP. There are some niche cases where this does maybe increase the mechanical thing. So what's harder? Is it harder to hit a headshot when your projectile is a little bit smaller? Or is it harder to hit two headshots in a row when the projectiles are a bit bigger? And for some characters, that's a legitimate question. I do think this is probably going to reduce the mechanical skill ceiling by a little bit. Um, the differences between the better, really, really good aim and great aim might be I hit four out of four headshots and you only hit three out of four headshots. I don't really know. I don't know how this is going to feel. I don't know how significant these changes are going to be. I do know they're going to be, you're going to, you're going to notice them. They're going to be tangible, but is this going to break some matchups? Is this going to break some characters? Are some characters going to feel worse and some characters are going to feel better? I mean, this affects everything, guys, everything. This is everything. This is the game changing. And to me, this seems like Overwatch 2's developers best attempt to deal with one shots and burst damage in this game and making it easier to increase shots. So not necessarily reducing the time to kill but making consistent damage a more viable way of killing a target. And crucially here as well is you notice that healing numbers have not gone up, only the damage numbers. So to heal some of these targets is going to take a lot more effort and maybe not be as completely viable. In other words, when I'm a, trying to heal a tank that has 700 HP, um, you know, at some point you have to ask myself, can I actually even out heal the damage that they're taking? Because the hitboxes of those bullets are slightly faster. Now, a tank isn't really a great analogy because tanks already were easy to hit but like let's say i'm trying to heal up uh, a 250 hp target but that target instead of being able to 80 80 strafe and dodge all the damage <coughs> kiriko that target is actually getting hit right now and so maybe burst healing isn't going to work as well now before you guys in the comments pipe off here you're there is one glaring point here this doesn't really address immortalities things like lamp things like suzu those are going to be relatively unaffected because the invulnerability is not really affected by the size of your health pool and so that, that is definitely something that we have to continue to, this is not going to magically fix all our issues. Uh, and this is probably not going to ruin everything. 
So there's a lot here that remains to be unpacked. And honestly, I don't think anybody can fully predict what's going to happen here. What we can predict is some things are going to feel probably okay, and some things are going to feel pretty bad. But how is the whole package going to be? I don't think we know. I am not cynical. I am not optimistic. I am just cautious. I'm scared. I'm not going to lie with you guys. I don't necessarily trust the developer team fully to make a change this big, but I do appreciate them trying. And I think that's the key thing is you guys have gone back to a couple of my videos ago where we talked about how the need for experimental mode, the need to try these aggressive changes to deal with issues, to take risks even. My concern is that doing it on a live game the day of with no testing, no experimental mode, no nothing, I don't agree with that. And that definitely is something that I'm going to criticize regardless of how well, even if this is perfect, even if this is great, fixes the game, still. That's not a generally, that's not a trend that I want to see moving forward and, and nothing but a perfect development team would be able to do that. And Overwatch 2 does not have a perfect developing team. I don't think any game does. Um, anyway, that being said, chew on that as much as you like. There's way too much to unpack here in really one discussion. And again, we don't want to spend so much time when we really don't know everything that's going to be going on uh, with the patch notes go live. Now, one thing I do want to point out as well, I'm about to leak some changes from uh, the patch notes. I haven't done this so far, so if you want, skip ahead 30 seconds. Um, Non-projectile damage has been buffed. Right and swing, Junker Queen Carnage, Blade Swing Speed for, for Genji, and things like Brig Flail have been buffed, um, according to the leaked patch notes, which I believe are, will be at least mostly correct. So you're thinking, wow, all the non-aim you know aim damage is, is bad, you know, because everyone's health pools. No, it got, it got buffed pretty significantly. So anyway. All right, giving more self-reliance in team fights. You want to make sure that the flow of the team doesn't take away from individual player decisions and so on, yada, 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 yada. Uh, change perception of pools, blah, blah, blah. Being able to take longer to heal someone from one HP to full health. The ease of friction of an increased time to fully heal allies of combat. Blah, 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 blah. Everyone can now regenerate health passively at a rate of 20 healing per second after five seconds of not taking damage. This is, I think, a change that I am cautiously optimistic about. Um, I was a little bit skeptical because I wasn't sure what this timer here was going to be, but I think five seconds is a pretty good spot to start with. What this means is this means more autonomy for DPS players. This isn't just, oh, flankers are going to be strong because five seconds is a pretty long time for even a flanker to not be shooting or not being damaged. But five seconds as a Cassidy on an angle, a Hanzo on an angle, a Widow on an angle, a Sojourn on an angle, uh, a Torbjorn, a Symmetra. Uh, I mean, she already has shields, I guess. But there's a lot of characters that are going to be able to take more uh, action and be more proactive in their positioning because of this. A lot of heroes that don't have mobility or self-sustain were a little bit limited with the type of angles that they could take because they usually demanded some form of support. Even a character like Farah is going to benefit from this. Um, but this is big news, and I, I actually think this is probably going to be a good change. Now, the key thing to note is you probably have noticed that I've only mentioned DPS. Um, what this is going to do is this is going to take the worst case scenario for DPS that aren't getting healed. It's going to make it feel better. How many times have you had a game where, oh, my supports won't heal me, or I can't take a flank, or I can't take an angle, and it feels really bad, and I just die, and so on. That's probably happened a little bit to everybody. This is going to take the edge off of that sting. I know some of you guys are going to be like, well, back in my day, you ought to get a health back, and it's 20 healing per second over five seconds. That's 100 healing after 10 seconds. That's not a lot of healing. That's not a lot of healing. And in addition here, it doesn't necessarily make it easier to play. It, yes, removes the floor. It increases the floor and allows you to be better even when your team, when the situation is really bad. That definitely makes the floor a little bit easier. But because you have this passive, you are going to be required and expected to do more as a DPS because you're going to be able to take more aggressive and more selfish off angles. So yes, the floor is raising, but the ceiling is raising too. So you old school try hard boomers, no offense, that are out there like, oh, it's going to make the game easier. No, it's not. It's actually going to keep the game at the same skill level by punishing the worst case scenario less often, yes, but allowing you to actually go out and make more aggressive plays. And in a PvP environment, giving people the uh, opportunity to do more means that you are expected to do more because you better darn well believe that the enemy DPS are going to be doing the same thing. And if they're the ones that are utilizing the DPS passive and you're not, then they're going to be carrying the game and you're going to be losing. And so it's the opportunity for more skillful expression that gives you more responsibility. It's the same thing, the same discussion that we had with the support passive. When you have the support passive, if you're not using the support passive to be more proactive as support and abusing your survivability a little bit, you will be stuck in plat for the rest of your days. And we're going to probably have this all over again. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, speaking of the support passive, that has been nerfed slightly. I believe the timer was two seconds and now it is 2.5 seconds. So is that a significant change? Yes. Uh, is it enough? Maybe, maybe not. I think it remains, remains to be seen. I think three seconds would probably have been a slightly more fair timer, um, but it's it's a good change and so we're happy. Now, one thing I, I wanted to bring up earlier, but kind of got segued here, is uh, 
this is not really going to affect tanks. Let's be honest here. It's going to help tanks slightly. Uh, I know Doomfist would, would appreciate this. Uh, I know Wrecking Ball will appreciate this. Um, but for the most part, this is not going to be that big of a change for tanks because 20 healing per second is like almost meaningless for tanks. So this might be something that we see that creeps up for tanks, um, depending on the tank. I'm not really sure. This is a dangerous thing to incorporate as an all hero passive uh, because obviously it's going to disproportionately affect other heroes more than others. Uh, some heroes more than others. And I think this is like a common thing that we've had with role passive, even going back to the support passive and the tank passive, where some heroes really benefit from the passive and some heroes don't. Like the support passive, for example, really wasn't all that useful for Mercy initially. It wasn't really all that useful characters like Moira. Um, and so characters like Ana and Brig, uh, even Zenyatta uh, uh, didn't really benefit much from, but Ana and Brig and so on benefit a lot from it. Others don't. And I think this is why I don't love the idea of role passes as a whole. I don't mind having passive abilities. I don't even mind a lot of heroes having similar passive abilities. Like, let's say, like, half the support cast has a passive of out-of-combat healing. I mean, that's fine with me. It just doesn't need to be applied indiscriminately because, like we've seen with Hanzo, with the old DPS passive, some passives just aren't useful. And I think that that's the problem is when you have this wide, diverse area of characters, a cast of characters, that having a ubiquitous or a universal, excuse me, role passive means that you're forcing yourself to find something that everyone will find useful. And that honestly just makes things way, way too difficult. So I don't, I don't love it. Uh, speaking of that, whoops, the role passive for DPS, 20% healing reduction. Um, I won't dig into this too much. I, I'm a little bit concerned about the propensity to focus tank with this uh, because it will be very easy to proc this on a tank. Um, and that's probably going to be where you're going to feel it the most. Uh, because having 20% less healing, um, unless you're having an extended fight with a support, which is generally not the case, probably not going to be as much of an issue. Uh, I, I don't think this is going to necessarily mean that tanks are going to feel too bad, but it's definitely going to be another another problem for tanks to worry about, because now Reinhardt can get tickled by a Tracer who's on his backline with five damage, and now he's taking 20% reduced healing, and what the frick, guys? You know, So it, you know, is it going to be uh, game-breaking? Maybe not. I don't think these stack. I've been asked this a few times. I really would be surprised if these stack from two DPS. Um, but I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this passive. I, I like the idea of the change. It seems like one of those things that they're going to throw bone to the DPS players, guys. Hey, look at that. You could reduce damage. Haha. But it, it, again, it's going to come back to it's going to affect tanks more than anything else. I'd like to see this become um, more of like a when you deal a raw percentage of uh, amount of damage. This is the amount of damage roll passive that's going to be received. In other words, you have to deal a certain amount of damage for you to proc the role passive. Um, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind as well is like, who are going to be the characters that benefit from this so much? It's going to be like, imagine Bastion with this, you know what I'm saying? Like, how are you going to feel as Winston, you know, <laughs> or like, how are you going to feel like as a Reaper uh, with not only are you healing yourself, but you're reducing the targets healing as well. Um, you know, it's just a lot of tank busters are just going to benefit from this disproportionately, I think. Um, and so that, that kind of annoys me, but it is what it is. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. I just hope that, again, that we see that sometimes even like just slapping on big, big things like this don't always address all the issues. Um, last thing I'll say, last thing I'll say here, there's a lot more to say. I'm just going to kind of cut the video short and, and we'll, 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 we'll wait and see on patch day. Last thing I'll say is that on Tuesday, we will be streaming at 2.15 p.m. EST, uh, a couple hours after the, but I guess right actually when the patch usually, usually goes live. And we are going to be going over every change, every patch, discussing it in full. And if you aren't able to make it to stream, we will be probably releasing a video on Wednesday, the day afterwards, fully discussing the changes in detail. Um, and so there's a lot to, to be unpacked. I'm really excited to go see that. Oh, one more thing. So if you don't want any spoilers, please end the video here. Three, two, one, here we go. Far Rework has been leaked. And it looks very similar to some of the things that we asked for actually in our re DPS rework uh, project from set many, 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 many months ago. Uh, a lot more horizontal mobility. It doesn't look like there's as much vertical mobility, a lot more freedom with movement and some even interactive stuff with fuel. Um, I think the video got deleted, so you might have to just hang tight, uh, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, also, obviously, there's a ton of major number changes going on behind the scenes. Uh, like I said, some of the things like blade swing speed for Genji is getting buffed. Um, so there's all sorts of things that are going to be going on. Um, but crucially, no ball changes. However, I do think ball is going to be getting some buffs. I think it just hasn't been released yet. Surely, guys, surely. But anyway, let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you guys on Tuesday.